Today, I'm going over the different Presbyterian confessions and trying to convince you guys that they're not all exactly the same. Hey guys, welcome back to Kingdom Craft, where I build this big church in Minecraft while I talk about Christianity. Today, I'm going to be talking about the different Presbyterian confessions, and I actually have most of these confessions written in Minecraft books. It took a long time to transcribe these, and I don't have all of them because some of them were a bit too long and I was too lazy to do it, but I'm going to be putting these in my library while I go over each one. So, I am part of the Presbyterian Church USA, which uses a bunch of different confessions throughout many time periods in history. Whereas other Presbyterian denominations like the PCA, the OPC, the EPC, um, they just use basically Westminster. That's their only official confessional document. But um, I think it's best to use a lot of different confessional documents from all over history. So we don't just use Westminster, even though Westminster is like our most important confession. We have the Apostles and Nicene Creeds. We have the Scots Confession, which I kind of like a little bit better than Westminster. We have also the Heidelberg Catechism and the Second Helvetic Confession, which are not actually Presbyterian confessions, but come from the same broader Calvinist tradition as we do. And we have some more modern confessions, like the Confession of 1967, the Theological Declaration of Barman, and the Brief Statement of Faith, which was written when the PCUSA formed in 1983. So, I'm going to say what each of these confessions contributes to our faith. So, I think the value of using a lot of confessions is it says that we are a tradition that has moved throughout history. And we have, we have basically evolved throughout history because um, society is always in motion and so is the church. Whereas, if you just stick to one confession, it's almost like you're trying to be frozen in time. So, the churches that only use the Westminster Confession and nothing else, it kind of feels like hey, the, these 1600 Puritans got it exactly right, and we just want to be exactly like them. Um, I know that's not exactly what they're saying, but that's sort of how it sounds. Whereas if you have um, a bunch of different confessions, it's like, we are part of the Reformed tradition. We are Reformed and always Reforming, but we'll never forget where we came from, and we'll always try to be rooted in tradition. Um, and I know the PCUSA is not always good at being rooted in tradition, um, but and I know the PCUSA has all the problems. But I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to fix those. I'm trying to promote orthodoxy within the PCUSA, and the best way to promote orthodoxy is to stick to the confessions of your denomination. So um, I put those books in the library, and uh, I might actually take one of them. I'll I'll take some of them just with me because I want to show you guys some other Presbyterian churches that other people on the server have built. The first confession I'm going to go over is the Apostles and Nicene Creeds. Those are really two of them, but, you know, they're short, so I put them in the same book. So, the Nicene Creed functions basically as a gatekeeper of true versus false Christianity. Now, in a lot of Protestant circles, people accuse each other of heresy for this and that, like, oh, if you disagree with me on this political issue, you're a heretic. But historically, the formal definition of true versus false Christianity has been the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed isn't a perfect determiner of orthodoxy versus heresy, which is why subsequent councils had to clarify what the Nicene Creed meant on certain things. Like, the Nicene Creed says the Father is God and Jesus is God. It doesn't explicitly say the Holy Spirit is God. It says the Holy Spirit is the Lord, but then they had to have another council to clarify what it meant. So it's not perfect, but it's the best objective standard we have for determining what orthodoxy is. And let me just show you guys what it is. So, this is the Apostles' Creed. Many of you might be familiar with it if you read it in your churches. It says, I believe in the God, the Father, Almighty, Maker of Heaven and Earth. I'm not gonna read all these because a lot of them are long. Nicene Creed is very similar to the Apostles' Creed. It's just more detailed. So I would say the function of the Apostles' Creed is primarily to be a brief summary of the entire Christian faith. That can apply to all Christians, not just Presbyterians. So the Apostles and Nicene Creeds, they are not unique to Presbyterians. They are the things that all Christians have in common. I forget if the East uses the Apostles' Creed. They, they do use the Nicene Creed, though. So whether you're Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, and if you're Protestant, whether you're Lutheran, Methodist, Baptist, um, I don't know, Anglican, all Protestants, all historic Protestants, that is, use the, use the Nicene Creed. So the Nicene Creed is um, the Ecumenical Creed, and, and both the Apostles and Nicene Creeds are called the Ecumenical Creeds, but the Nicene Creed is more detailed. It defines Jesus, it defines God, and it's, um, 
It's very helpful for determining what that is. Okay, there's another church on the side of this wall. This wall separates like my property from other people's property. Of course, I have the most because I own this place. But there are some really cool Presbyterian churches people have built here. For example, um, I know there's some of these look like they're works in progress. I'm excited to see what... Okay, there, there's a lighthouse church over here that someone built. So I'm going to take a quick look at that. So the first uniquely Presbyterian confession I'm going to go over is the Scots Confession. This was written by the founder of Presbyterianism, John Knox. And I know hearing this, my Catholic and Orthodox followers are going to be like, your church was started by a man, our church was started by Jesus. I, and Jesus is a man. Um, well, he is the founder of Presbyterianism as a distinct tradition, but he was still um, part of the Catholic tradition before that. The Reformers saw themselves as continuing the broader Catholic tradition, just reforming it with the Bible. But John Knox is the figure that defines Presbyterianism as a distinct tradition, and he wrote the Scots Confession. What I love about the Scots Confession is how fiery and passionate it is, and um, I think it's important to use the Scots Confession. There's a ton I like about it. Um, because one of the reasons I think it's better than Westminster is it's actually from the Reformation. It's actually written by a reformer. The Westminster Confession is good, but it's a Puritan document. It's not a Reformation document. And the Puritans had slightly different priori- Okay, this is a nice place. The Puritans had slightly different priorities than the reformers because the Puritans were after the whole Arminian controversy, which is why the Westminster Confession is very centered on specifically having a reformed doctrine of predestination. It's very specific on that. Whereas the Scots Confession doesn't focus that much on predestination. Because contrary to popular belief, Calvinism was not really about predestination until after the Arminian controversy. The, what Calvinism originally meant was the word Calvinist was used by Lutherans to define the reformed Calvinist view of the sacraments, but a lot of modern Calvinists do not know what the reformed view of the sacraments is. The Westminster Confession does indeed um, sort of define the reformed view of the sacraments, but it's, I don't like how it's worded. It's worded such that a more symbolic interpretation can be taken. Because according to classic Reformed Presbyterian theology, the sacraments are not just symbols. The sacraments are means of salvation. And Westminster does say that, but it's a bit more vague. So that's why I like the Scots Confession. The Scots Confession has the highest sacramentology, the highest view and explanation of the sacraments that all the confessions have. Um, let me show you. So uh, let me just scroll through this. Yes, of the sacraments. It says... Um, it says... Uh, Okay, where is it? Yes. It says, We utterly damn the vanity of those that affirm the sacraments to be nothing else but naked and bare signs. We believe that by baptism we are engrafted in Christ Jesus to be made partakers of his justice, by the which our sins are covered and remitted. So there, it's saying that baptism saves. A lot of people think that goes against Reformed theology, but the original Reformers, John Calvin, John Knox, they believed baptism saves. Um, however, when I go over Westminster, I'm going to clarify what the Reformers mean by baptism saves. It's different than what the Catholics mean. It also says, in the Lord's Supper, Christ Jesus is so joined to us, he becomes the very nourishment of our souls. Now, it re rejects transubstantiation here. We're not Roman Catholic. Um, but um, it says the communion we have with the body and blood of Christ is by the operation of the Holy Ghost. And we really feed on the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And it talks about our union with Christ. There are a lot these ideas about um, the spiritual but real eating of Jesus's flesh and blood in the Lord's Supper is something John Calvin and John Knox strongly believed. But it's something that's lost on a lot of modern Reformed people. You go to your average PCA church, and they, they'll do the Lord's Supper, and they'll say it's a, it's an important covenant sign and seal. But they probably won't say we actually receive the body and blood of Christ. Um, and same like uh, in baptism. At a PCA church, it's very common to hear the pastor say baptism doesn't save. But that's not classic Reformed theology. I just showed you from the, the founder of Presbyterianism, John Knox, that baptism, he believed baptism doesn't save. If you, if you don't believe baptism saves, I mean, the Bible says baptism saves, 1 Peter 3.21. But if your interpretation of that is more symbolic, fine. But you... You need to understand that classic Reformed theology does indeed teach that baptism saves. So I honestly think my theory is that the, one of the reasons the PCA has a lower sacramentology than John Calvin and John Knox did is because they don't use the Scots Confession. They only use Westminster. And there's a ton I love about the Scots Confession. Um, but it's not perfect because it's written just by one guy. 
um, John Knox, whereas the Westminster Conf I think it, he might have had help from a few other people, but the Westminster Confession is a lot more academic and formal. It's written out in like bullet points with scripture references, whereas the Scots Confession just has like paragraphs of John Knox going on like passionate, like almost like rants. If you know the life of John Knox, he was very fiery guy. He was like the Martin Luther of Calvinism almost. Um, so yeah, the Scots Confession is not perfect, and we have to acknowledge that. Okay, now I'm going to go back up to my library and uh, take some of the other books. So uh, our Book of Confessions, which is the book that contains all the... Con okay, keep forgetting, the library's on the third floor. Our Book of Confessions also contains Reformation documents that are not from the, Presbyt the Scottish Presbyterian Reformation, but are from other uh, European Reformations. So we have the Heidelberg Catechism, which is from the Dutch Reformed, and the Second Helvetic Confession, which is from the Swiss Reformed. Um, and I think this is important to, like, um, because Reformed theology is lowercase c Catholic. It's universal. It's not confined to any one ethnicity. Uh, there were a lot of forgotten Calvinist reformations all throughout Europe. There was, like, a Spanish Reformation. There's even a, a Polish and even a Lithuanian Reformed Church that exists to this day. And I'm I'm one quarter Lithuanian, so we got to represent the, the forgotten Lithuanian Calvinists over here. Um, but anyway, that's off topic. So the Heidelberg Catechism is one of it's one of the three forms of unity that the Dutch Reformed churches use, and it is part of the PCUSA's Book of Confessions as well. Now, theologically, I think the um, Heidelberg Catechism is honestly a bit underwhelming. Regarding the sacraments, it is very vague, and it almost sounds like it has an, a symbolic view of the sacraments. I know that it's that's not what it is, but it almost sounds that way. However, I don't think the purpose of the Heidelberg Catechism is to be um, a source of like a source of doctrine. I think it's uh, meant to for liturgical use because the way it's structured is it has a question and answers questions and answers for each Lord's Day, each Sabbath Sunday for the whole year. So there's 52 questions and answers. Um, it's meant to be read in a liturgical service, and I think it functions great at that. It's very pastoral sounding, and a lot of the other confessions don't sound a bit cold, but the Heidelberg Catechism is very warm and pastoral. The first question is, what is your only comfort in life and death? It says, the answer is that I'm not my own, that I am bought at a price. Okay, here's St. Paul's Presbyterian Church, um, founded uh, three days ago. <laughs> but it's it's already looking really good, and I know it's it seems like a bit of a work in progress because the windows are empty, but it already looks really awesome. Okay, they have a nice communion table in the front. I love this design. Okay, all these churches, even though they're smaller than mine, and the only reason they're smaller is because I didn't give them enough land to build bigger, um, they're smaller than my church, right? But they use a lot more, like, complex stone materials than I did. I just used bare cobblestone, and my church used to be, like, really beautiful, but now, like, compared to all these other ones, it looks kind of bad. Okay, I'm just breaking through these walls. I know there is there is actually a path that leads out of here, but I'm too lazy to remember where the path is, even though I'm literally the one who built it. Um... I made the path, but other people made all these churches. I made this church that's behind me. Um, okay, so that's the Heidelberg Catechism. Then there's the Second Helvetic Confession, written by Heinrich Bullinger. Um, uh, he took over after, like, Zwingli in the Swiss Reformation. And Zwingli is notorious for having a low symbolic view of the sacraments. But John Calvin convinced Heinrich Bollinger, who came after him, to adopt a much higher view. Now, Bollinger's view isn't quite as high as Calvin. For example, um, Calvin thought that the bread and wine are the instruments by which we receive the body and blood of Christ, whereas Heinrich Bollinger said, um, we receive the body and blood of Christ at the same time as we eat the bread and drink the wine, but they're not like instruments. It's just what is called sacramental parallelism. But it's still much closer to Calvin than Zwingli. And you can sort of see Heinrich Bollinger's views expressed in the Second Helvetic Confession, which he wrote. Um, but I really like the Second Helvetic Confession. It says a lot of things that, um, that, like, you... It says a lot of things that the other confessions don't say. It's like if you want some alternative explanations to things. Like, it has the highest m view of Mary of all the Reformed Confessions. Um, you could argue that Heinrich Bollinger believed in the bodily assumption of Mary. I'm not saying I believe that. Um... But, uh, j just read it. The, the Second Helvetic Confession is really interesting. It goes into very interesting detail about a lot of subjects you wouldn't think would be going to detail about. Also, I like how the Second Helvetic Confession says that, um, we, Reformed Christianity, is 
Catholic, lowercase c Catholic. We are not trying to start a new church. We are continuing the Western Catholic traditions, um, just reforming them by the Bible. And Heinrich Bollinger was very careful to say that. And that's why I'm a big fan of Heinrich Bollinger. Okay, the next one is the Westminster Confession. Really, it's the Westminster Standards because there's the Westminster Confession and the larger and shorter catechisms. So the, the last three things I went over are Reformation documents. By the way, this Presbyterian church that was built um, is Covenant Presbyterian Church. It is absolutely beautiful. Just, just, just look at it. I'm, I'm going to walk around it a bit before I go inside. Okay, so the Westminster Standards were written by, um, we're actually not from Scotland, which is where Presbyterianism is from. It's from England during the English Civil War, when England briefly became Presbyterian. I don't really know the history, uh, just, just a crash course version of it. But basically what happened is uh, a bunch of what are known as the Westminster Divines. All these um, Calvinist Presbyterian pastors got together at the Westminster Assembly and carefully studied the scriptures to write the Westminster Confession. So the Westminster Confession is superior in in that it is the most well-researched. It has a lot of scripture proofs for like every sentence. So that, that's why it's a lot more formal and organized than like the Scots Confession, for example. But I, there are other things the Scots Confession is good at that the Westminster Confession isn't so good at. So I think they balance each other out. Oh nice, there's a lectern. Maybe I'll put the the Westminster Confession on the lectern. So this is not the Westminster Confession, actually. I didn't have time to write that in the Minecraft book. This is the Westminster Shorter Catechism. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Amen. This is based. So the Westminster Confession, I think its purpose is to be a very careful, in-depth explanation of the reform doctrine of stuff. Um, and it also is very good about going into the reform doctrine of God and um, with the catechisms do as well is define terms like what is justification, what is sanctification, what is adoption, all these theology terms, they do a good job defining them. So yeah, you go through all these questions, and although that, I said, like I said, the Westminster Confession um, has a bit lower view, I don't want to say lower, a bit, a bit less of an explicitly um, sacramental view than the Scots Confession, what I, what I do like about it is that it is also clarifies how the reform doctrine of the sacraments is different than the Catholic document of the sacraments. And I'll, I'll explain this. Um, so let me see. Uh, there's, I'm going to show where it talks about the sacraments. Um, okay. So, um, this says, how do the sacraments become effectual means of salvation? So this is still a pretty high view of the sacraments. It is still saying the sacraments are means of salvation. They're not symbols. But then it says, the sacraments become effectual means of salvation, not from any virtue in them or in him that administers them, but only by the blessing of Christ and the working of the Holy Spirit. That's the important thing. Um, the Catholics believe the sacraments work ex opere operato, meaning the sacraments have the power in and of themselves to bestow grace. Whereas Reformed theology says the sacraments um, are means of salvation for the elect, for those that have faith in Christ. So the sacraments cannot do anything apart from faith. And the Westminster Confession also says that there are two parts of a sacrament, the sign and the thing signified. So we, unlike the Catholics and the Lutherans, we try to distinguish the sign and the thing signified. So we say baptism saves. But when we say that, we are defining baptism as both the outward baptism with water and the inward baptism of the Holy Spirit. But we're not separating it into water baptism and spirit baptism like the Baptists do. Um, we let... We don't separate the two, but we don't mix the two either. From our perspective, the Baptists tend to separate um, the two parts of baptism, and the Catholics tend to mix them into one. So we say baptism saves, but only for those who have faith. Uh, if you don't have faith, baptism can't save you. Um, and, um, okay, people are talking about mainline Protestantism in the chat. People are having a conversation about mainline Protestantism without me. How can they do that? Um, and in the Lord's Supper, we do receive the body and blood of Christ, but we don't believe in transubstantiation. We believe that we receive it spiritually. Anyway, so then there was like 300 years where they didn't write any confessions, as far as I know, at least not ones that are in our book of confessions. But then um, there's the Theological Declaration of Barman. And this was written by Karl Barth, Karl Barth, sorry, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, and they are people that represent a movement known as Neo-Orthodoxy. I know this this movement is kind of controversial, but basically, in the 1800s, theological liberalism took over the Protestant churches, which is basically where people stopped believing in the, the authority of the Bible and stopped believing in the Christian essentials. 
Neo-Orthodoxy, which Karl Barth is the biggest representative of, is basically um, a rejection of liberalism. And um, this really came to a head in, the, in, the, in Nazi Germany, 1930s Germany. Um, so we have a confession written by Dietrich Bonhoeffer from 1935 that rejects Nazism back before any of the major like allied powers rejected it. I think that's pretty cool um, because we have confessions that had a lot of historical significance. Because in it, it might sound hard to believe, but it was actually the theologically liberal churches that sided with the Third Reich, that sided with the Nazis in Nazi Germany. Um, here's what I mean by that. Theologically liberal doesn't necessarily mean, like, gay flags and stuff. That's what it means today. But it really just means you don't take the claims of Christianity seriously. So when the church no longer has anything of its own to say, the church just goes along with whatever the culture says. So what has always happened in theologically liberal churches, ones that don't believe the authority of the scriptures, is um, they just go along with whatever their culture is saying. And now the culture is saying you need to be all woke and stuff. So that's why theologically liberal churches these days are all woke and flying pride flags and stuff. But um, back in the day, back in uh, 1930s Germany, the thing the culture was saying is you need to support whatever the Nazi party supports. And that's why there were the quote-unquote German churches that sided with, um, the, sided with the Nazi party. Now, of course, um, Hitler was not a Christian at all. He explicitly rejected Christianity. He rejected the Catholicism that he was born into. But um, he, he needed everyone to go along with him. So a lot of the churches were pressured to comply with the Nazis. And this statement, the theological declaration of Barman, was a rejection of, was saying, we will not submit to the idols of this culture. That's a very important confession for the church to have, especially in this day and age, when the culture is pressuring the church to uh, submit to the idols of our culture. I'm not saying we are in as bad a, as bad a place as Karl Barth and Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer tried to kill Hitler and he failed, so he was killed himself, but he still went down as a martyr. Um, he was still very important. So yeah, this, uh, this document is still a very important document. I think it's very important to have in our book of confessions. And... I know that Bart and Dietrich Bonhoeffer, like, the, uh, theologically, they believe things that are questionable. And there are things I disagree with them on. I don't agree with neo-orthodoxy on everything. Am I going to make it? Yeah. I don't agree with neo-orthodoxy on everything. But they do, um, they do say a lot of very, very good things. One of them is that, um, here it is. We reject the false doctrine as though the church in human arrogance could place the word and work of the Lord in the service of any arbitrarily chosen desires, purposes, and plans. This is the big thing. The church cannot support the agendas of this world. That's what the modern mainline churches are trying to do by supporting like whatever the diversity, equity, and inclusion wants us to do because they're theologically liberal. They don't have anything to say themselves, so they just say whatever the culture says. And this document was written as an explicit rejection of that. Um, so that's why this, 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 that's why this one's important. Okay, so the next one is the Confession of 1967. Um... And this one is pretty important. It's also has a... This wasn't written by Karl Barth, but it is basically adopting a lot of the theology of Karl Barth into the Presbyterian Church USA. And the reason this is important is it's, uh, it's written in the modern era. It responds to the issues of modernity. And some conservative reform people have criticized this. They, they say it sounds liberal. I don't think this is liberal because this is the one confession that we have that rejects the sexual anarchy of the modern world. If you were to ask someone, like, which Presbyterian denomination has a confession that explicitly rejects modern sexual anarchy and, like, sexual immorality in the modern world with, like, birth control and stuff like that, um, you would think it's the PCA, because the PCA is generally the more conservative denomination. But no, they only use Westminster. The answer is the PCUSA. They have the Confession of 1967. And the Confession of 1967 also condemns racism. Um, it's, I think, it's not not the only one. It's the first confession that does so. That's an important thing. Um, it condemns the ex the exploitation of the environment. And this is why people think it sounds woke. Guys, being against racism and being against exploiting the environment are not woke things, all right? Those are things that all Christians should care about. And those are things that Christians historically have worked for. It's just because of our modern political polarization that people say those are woke things. They're not woke things. Um, God is restoring all things. That means uh, reconciling all races to himself and reconciling the world, which includes the physical creation to himself. And that's something 
that mainline Protestants are much better at talking about than evangelical Protestants. Evangelical Protestants, and this sort of includes conservative Presbyterian denominations like the PCA, um, often make it sound like the goal of Christianity is the salvation of your soul and you personally going to heaven. Um, what's What the goal of Christianity actually is, is heaven coming down to earth. And um, when Jesus comes back, the entire world will be reconciled back to God. So it's not just about the salvation of you individually. There is an individual def uh, dimension of that, but it's about the salvation of the world collectively as well. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean all will be saved. It's just that there is an individual dimension of salvation and a cosmic dimension of salvation. And that's what the modern confessions address that the um, older confessions don't address, not to their fault, because those weren't the questions of those times. During the um, Reformation, the questions were like, what, how do we define the church and the sacraments? So that's why the Scots Confession does the best job providing biblical answers to that. In the 1600s, in the um, post arminian controversy era, the question was, what is the biblical doctrine of predestination? And the Westminster Confession was written partially to address that. In the 1930s, the question is, what do we do with all these dictators? The Theological Declaration of Barman was written to address that. In the modern world, it's like, okay, now there's all this technology, um, there's like a sort of racial conflict, what, what do we do to address that? And the Confession of 1967 was written for that. Finally, there's the brief statement of faith, and it is brief. This is just written by the PCUSA in 1983 when it formed. It formed as a union of two existing denominations, though, so it's not like it was a brand new thing. It, um, it formed uh, out of the northern half and the southern half, so there's still a lot of continuity there. But yeah, it says... Uh, in life and death, we belong to God. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But it confesses all the Christian orthodoxy. Like, Jesus is truly, fully human, fully God. Um, it confesses the Christian orthodoxy, but it also focuses more on the message of Christ. Like, the, the Nicene Creed um, doesn't focus much on what Christ preached. Um, here it does. It says Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives. Now, the Nicene Creed was not convened for that purpose. I'm not saying the Nicene Creed was at fault. Back then, Christians were already doing a great job at doing service to the poor. Um, if you read certain early church father quotes, let me just say they don't sound like free market capitalists. I'll, I'll just say that much. I won't say any more. Um, so it wasn't necessary. But in the modern world, it, it is necessary to address that. It, the Nicene Creed was convened to address, is Jesus truly God? And they had to answer emphatically, yes. Um, but um, Sorry, the, the Council of Nicaea, which produced the, the Nicene Creed. So yeah, it talks about what Jesus actually did. It doesn't just skip from his um, uh, like birth to his death. And um, it explicitly affirms the resurrection, so it, it's still fully orthodox. Some people think it's liberal because it's PCUSA, but no, this is not a liberal thing. And also this talks about um, how we sin. It goes into more depth of like how we ignore God's commandments and we exploit nature and threaten death to our planet. Again, this is not woke. I think this is something that Gen Z conservatives are finally realizing, that being environmentally conscious is not a woke thing. Um, rejecting, like, um, environmentalism as wokeness, that's more of a boomer conservative, conservatism thing. But, like, guys, if you poop on the floor of your room, you're not going to want to live in your room. Likewise, if you, um, like, dump a bunch of garbage on the planet where you live, you're not going to want to live on that planet. Environmentalism should be basic common sense. It's, it's like, it's the same reason you don't poop on the floor of your room, seriously. Um, and yeah, the brief statement, it, it is just that. It is a brief statement of faith. I think it's a very good brief statement of faith. And another thing I like that it says is, where is it? Um, the Holy Spirit, um, okay, we trust in God, the Holy Spirit. It, yes, it says the Holy Spirit is God. Um, and where is it? Uh, give this. Uh, okay, th th it says something about the Holy Spirit claims us in the waters of baptism. Um, if I just skipped over, yeah, here, sixty-two. The Holy Spirit claims us in the waters of baptism. That's a very good way to put the um, Reformed view of baptism, and it's another way of saying that um, we do not believe baptism is just a symbol. So I'd say the function of the brief statement of faith is to be a brief statement of faith, but again, in a modern context. Um, the, the Confession of 1967 functions more to address the issues of modernity in detail, whereas the brief statement is just to briefly state what we believe in a modern context, whereas the Apostles' Creed briefly states what we believe in a more ancient context. Obviously, I know the Apostles' Creed is way more important than the PCUSA brief statement of faith.
But it's it's good. It's we have a brief statement of just general Christianity and a brief statement of what my specific denomination believes. So guys, those are about all the Presbyterian confessions. The last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make a lectern for the, the front of my church. Yes, here we go, lectern, lectern. Now I'm going to um, run to the front of my church and end this video as soon as I place it because I am so sorry for keeping you guys longer than I normally do. Okay, and there we go.